Watcha, it's your boy Jack Slack, Fights Gone By podcast, coming at you on the 29th of October, and we've got a big weekend of fights coming up. Um, no, like, massive, well, I mean, it depends how much of a Bellator mark you are. I, I would say no massive ones, but some good ones all around. And, I, you know, we've got the retirement fight for Anderson Silva, allegedly, um, so that's, you know, a big deal. Not much going on in the way of news, so I think we'll get straight into it with this UFC card. Now, the headliner is Uriah Hall versus Anderson Silva. Take a second to appreciate that the poster is pretty good. You don't get that a lot. A lot of these posters are absolute garbage. Um, Some people liked the Korean zombie Ortega one, but I thought that was also just a mess. Um, You know, this one shows you what you're getting, but does it in an interesting style. Because you can end up going too obtuse (laughs) with the uh, some of the pride ones. Oh, it's it's an angel's wings. What does that tell us about the tournament that you're you're advertising? But then, if you just do people's heads, you know, no one will remember that ever. You want to do something provocative that gets the people going, like uh, Don King for the Rumble of the Jungle put up posters that said "From the Slave Ship to the Championship" <laughs> with an actual picture of the layout of the slave ship with the you know the um, schematics of slaves laid in laid down in rows. Uh, it was bad. It was bad. But yes, good poster for this one is is the point I was getting at. Um, Anderson Silva, obviously the star of the show here. Uriah Hall, not a bad fighter by any means. There was a point where, like, coming fresh off tough, he maybe just after he lost to Kelvin Gastelum, people were still excited for this guy like he could be the next Anderson Silva. You know, black, obviously, but, you know, long, gangly middleweight dude, striker, stopped a decent takedown, but known for his flashy knockouts and the, the wheel kick. Was uh, I mean it's the wheel kick is still his thing. Um, that one of him knocking out was it Bubba Singy? Who did he knock out? Oh no, Adam Seller. Um, yeah, the the wheel kick knockout from Tough that is still his legacy basically. It's like the Jeremy Stevens, uh, Rafael dos Anjos uppercut or the Anthony Pettis Showtime kick. Th- they're ten year old highlights, but we still get them trotted out every time like it's something that just happened. But he's had a weird old run. Um, Uriah Hall. Well, fuck it. No, not Uriah Hall. We'll talk about Anderson Silva right now. Because Anderson Silva, um, it's very strange. With all this GOAT discussion going on, and I'm not going to get dragged into GOAT discussion, but with all the GOAT discussion going on, it was probably about two years ago still that people were still talking about Anderson Silva, and they're not even talking about him anymore, which is very strange to me because, you know, not a lot has happened since then except that he lost some fights as an old man. Which, I mean, really goes to show that, like, People, you can actually tarnish your, your legacy with people because if BJ Penn had, had uh, retired after the Diego Sanchez win, he people would probably still be arguing over who was better, Habib or BJ Penn. It's because BJ went on and had like ten losses after that that um, you know people are. It's going to help Habib in a few years that he left on a on a on an undefeated streak. But yeah, just brutal. You know, Anderson Silva came in, changed the game. Changed the perception of striking in MMA. Basically tilted everything back away from you have to be a wrestler, otherwise you're going to lose. And then from about 20, you know, 2006 to 2012, unbeaten, best in the world. Middleweight king, beats everyone they put in front of him, often very, very impressively. Mid-2013, loses to Chris Weidman, has a rematch, loses again, and then it's just downhill from there. Now, he did taint his legacy somewhat with the steroid stuff, because he, uh, this is the thing. If you're an Anderson Silva fan, you can always say... Well, he only took the drugs because he broke his leg. Unfortunately, it's happened like twice since then. (laughs) And also there's that awkward uh, moment from the UFC Cribs program where he he has an interview in his pantry in front of a stack of... um, can't remember what it was like growth hormone or something like that. (laughs) People just pulled up the packet and were like, yeah, that's uh, that's great. Growth hormone, mate. Um, Obviously, back before you started, everyone was roiding their bolts off. post you started people are still using don't don't get it twisted there are people using and not getting caught but yes it has somewhat tainted his legacy though if you look at james irvin when he fought him james irvin was peak pre-usada uh ufc physique just looked ridiculous and then was also um the king of the run-up superman punch i was i was who was that chatting to oh it's uh, ben Folks hit me up and he was saying he was going to write something about the Superman punch. I don't know if he has yet. I didn't see it. But uh, he was just asking, like, why do you think that we don't really see it anymore? And I was saying, I, we do actually see it a fair bit. Like, if you watched, um, well, this was before the Casey Kenny fight, but Casey Kenny the other night, he was using little Superman punches. You see people like Loma Lukbunmi, 
uh, Marlon Marias, Israel Adesanya do that hip pump and then come in with the with the straight off the rear hand afterwards. The Superman punch from like Muay Thai and kickboxing was quite a short move. The reason it caught on in the MMA so much was because everyone was doing these big run up Superman punches like Roman Reigns. And it's a, it's a gorgeous dynamic move. You know, I said, um, I think it was Troy, that awful Brad Pitt movie where he does the big Superman punch with a spear. And that was a thing. Every action movie with men in, in armor with swords started doing the Superman overhead coming down with the stab um, because it's a really nice aesthetic move. But you can't do run up Superman punches on people who aren't garbage and <laughs> striking anymore. Um but James Irving was the man. He'd throw like two really hard run up low kicks and then run into a flying Superman punch from halfway across the cage and knock people out. I loved James Irving. He was just, um, just good fun. Also roided off his bombs. But, um, Anderson Silva, the whole thing fell apart after Chris Weidman. It, it is, yes, there's decline in play here because obviously he's had a really like, rough run, but he he met a couple of guys back-to-back who were difficult matchups for him. Um, Chris Weidman obviously stayed on his feet, fainted, and a lot dropped out of Weidman. Could have been USADA, could have also been uh, banning of IVs. Uh, he did do a big weight cut, uh, and it could have also been just the beating he took against Luke Rockhold. If you remember that fight, just he took a sustained pounding to the head for about a round and a half, probably. And then Luke Rockhold, in turn, went on and had his own, took a beating, fell from grace, has never recovered. Uh, it's a brutal division in that regard. Well, it's a brutal sport in that regard. But after they fought Nick Diaz, who was not scared of him and just put the pressure on him the whole time, which is kind of weird for Anderson Silva, who's been... The problem to that point had been finding people who were willing to step in. You know, you've got your Chael Sonnens and people like that who'll charge at you and your Chris Liebman back in 2006. But by 2012... People were, you know, 2015 is when the Nick Diaz fight happens. But by 2012, people had worked out that you shouldn't run at him. Um, and Nick Diaz is up in his grill, giving him pressure. And uh, it was a it was a close fight. Silva won the decision. A lot of people thought Diaz deserved the decision. Uh, and famously, Silva tested positive for actual hard steroids. And Nick Diaz tested positive for weed again. And Nick Diaz is banned to this day, or has <laughs> was banned for like five years, and uh, Anderson Silva was back in a year. So uh, just really just making a laughing stock of the entire system, or the system is making a laughing stock of itself. But then he fought Michael Bisping, and Michael Bisping, not only a very um, good fainting and volumey sort of fighter, but uh, obviously well aware of what Anderson Silva does, used... Uh, used feints and um, misdirection beautifully in that fight and didn't really give Anderson a lot to grab onto. Anderson's moments in that fight came as he went on the lead, but also Anderson's worst moments in that fight came like round one when he tried to do his flustery thing, which I was going to make a filthy casuals guide on this week, but then I couldn't be bothered. But, you know, Anderson Silva, if, he, if nothing had happened in a round, he would try and steal the end of it. And you'd, he'd move towards people and do that head movement, waving the hand stuff. And he really only wanted to just sneak one or two shots through. He just did a lot to try and get people um, jumpy before he did it. And that's really the sign of a guy who is almost purely a counterpuncher, because he's so aware of the openings he's opening up every time he throws his own strikes. They really had to go overkill on getting people worried about the strikes coming before he opened up. But yeah, he did that to Bisping in the first round and got knocked down off it. Um, so yeah, it was a very strange fight, but a great one. Really, really good fun. And the thing that I forgot was that he was actually booked to fight Uriah Hall before he met, uh, before he stepped in for Daniel Cormier. Sorry, uh, before he stepped in to fight Daniel Cormier at UFC 200. Um, but that was cancelled due to Silver getting ill, apparently. But then he fought Daniel Cormier, and that is also sort of like a standout there fight as, you know, clearly Anderson has declined, but he still almost knocked out Daniel Cormier with a body shot, something I forgot to talk about, where we were talking about how much Daniel Cormier hates body shots the other month. But that was an interesting fight because, you know, Daniel Cormier took him down a lot, but Silva was basically able to stall him out in half guard with the lockdown, which is really interesting because you expect top level fighters in MMA, top level grapplers especially, to not be hindered so much by what is, you know, day one hindering technique, basically. Eddie Bravo, when he started playing the lockdown, apparently it was a judo technique and they didn't like it because it was just sort of like a stall out technique. But he said, like, that was the thing that he learned. He just clinged onto it and then he started building stuff from it. Actually, shout out to... Uh, both Grace Gundrum and uh, BJJ Trickster, because I was watching BJJ Trickster's highlight of Grace Gundrum, and then I went and watched some Grace Gundrum matches. She's this dead-eyed, 
teenager from 10th Planet. And 10th Planet gets a lot of stick because they do they do weird shit that destroys your knees and they haven't had an awful lot of high-level tournament success, um, despite being a little bit culty. But uh, she's actually, like, impressing me in the way that... you. Know, it's kind of like... I'm trying to think of examples. Maybe like Total Football when the Dutch did that. But, you know, examples of like weird systems where you go, well, that system doesn't really work. How many high level titles do they win? And then you go, well, no, it's got to be someone who was training in that system from very young early on. And Grace Gundrum is kind of like that because she's doing all the the rubber guard stuff. She's using the lockdown beautifully. And um, in this particular BJJ Trickster breakdown, he showed, and then I had to go and find more instances of because I was so impressed. Um, She uses X guard, which is like a, you know, you get under someone when they're standing to break the opponent down and get them into a lockdown half guard, the kind that Anson Silva used, but with the leg on the shoulder. So you're already in the electric chair sweep. And I'd seen Eddie Bravo teach that on, well, he did it, he put it in his advanced rubber guard book. And he also, I think he taught it on one of his Mastering the System episodes. And I was going, mm, but would it really work though, Eddie? And I seen, you know, Eddie Bravo, like the whole thing about people being like, oh, it doesn't really work. It's just Eddie Bravo being mental you know he had that match with Hoyler Gracie where he hadn't he hadn't competed in something like well since the Hoyler Gracie match he did beat Hoyler Gracie by surprise got mugged by uh, Leo Vieira in the next round by he lost by like one of the largest points margins in ADCC history because Leo Vieira was just a guard passing machine with amazing cardio and Eddie Bravo was a guy who didn't have amazing cardio and did, did sort of weird stuff but when he did that rematch with Hoyler Gracie he used the electric chair in about five different ways. There's a great clip, of, well, there's a great episode of the JRE uh, where he sits with Joe Rogan and he just breaks down the match at Meta Morris. And yeah, they're both old men at that time, but he's still doing all this electric chair stuff that clearly Hoyler has never seen before. And you go, well, that's pretty cool. And then you see, you occasionally see like Gary Tonin will do the electric chair from the um, lockdown half guard. Uh, it's a uh, Macaco who still competes. You know, he was a uh, uh, Vale Tudo legend back in the day, but he still competes at high level um, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in like the Masters divisions. And uh, he still does the electric chair sweep. But to do it from a, on a standing opponent or, or break down a standing opponent to do it to them is very impressive. And Grace Gundrum does it. And the best thing is with the electric chair sweep, you land in you land on top in a position where if you cradle their head and leg, you have uh, you just un- unwrap your own legs and you'll pass their guard. And there's so many great clips of this last doing that. But anyway, that's the lockdown. <laughs> and uh, I was saying, I was very surprised that uh, Anderson Silva was able to stall out DC with just the lockdown. It was incredible. But it does, I mean, it, it still works incredibly well. Like uh, there's moments in the Habib RDA fight where Habib drops to his knees in half guard for a little bit and uh, RDA puts him in the lockdown and you can't really do anything about it for a little while. When I suppose when so much of your top pressure and uh, an ability to hit and hurt and move comes from being able to, to stack up on your legs, having one of your legs straightened out behind you makes it a lot harder. Makes sense, really. But, uh, yeah, just impressive to do it to people at that level. I saw Tom DeBlas has a new uh, instructional out on the lockdown. I would plug it, but I think they need to send me a freebie first. <laughs> so you had that weird fight with Daniel Cormier, which, you know... Yes, impressive on Anderson Silva's part, especially going up in weight, but also Daniel Cormier taking on um, uh, a, cha- a last-minute change of opponent, which is always... Y- y- I err on the side of giving the guy the benefit of the doubt there, like uh, TJ Dillashaw versus Joe Soto. Joe Soto uh, did a lot better than many people expected, partly because he was unexpected. And in fact, if I were managing a fighter and uh, they could do... You know, if they could last a few more weeks without the money... I think if you're you know if you're dealing with a good name who you reckon has a chance at a world title, don't fuck around with last minute replacements. It's it's incredibly dangerous, especially when you get to that level. Like Benil Dariush would be in title contention right now if he hadn't lost to Alexander Hernandez on short notice when no one knew who Hernandez was. And you look at Hernandez now and you go, well, knowing what we know about him, this is a very easy fight for Benil Dariush. But he came in as an unknown and he just sparked him. But anyway, enough about like last minute replacement matches. This is going to be a riffing episode, by the way. But um, then you remember he fought Derek. Blu- uh, sorry, then you remember Anderson Silva fought Derek Brunson, uh, which was yeah, like a lot of people were just happy to see Anderson Silva get a win, even though Brunson probably won it. To be honest, then he was due to fight Kelvin Gastelum, and Kelvin Gast that was in Shanghai. They were like, get Anderson Silva out there, at least then they'll care. Uh, and then. The fight was cancelled and um, Michael Bisping stepped in 
less than a month after being basically knocked out by George St. Pierre because there's no commission in Shanghai and the UFC were like, fuck him, let's just use him for all he's worth. And then, wouldn't you know it, gets knocked out by like the first good punch he takes. Incredible. That and like the uh, shipping Rashad Evans from commission to commission to try and get him cleared when there was like a big spot on his brain scan. Um, Those are the two ones that really scared me with the UFC. Or made me concerned, rather. But then, you know, Anderson Silva fought uh, Israel Adesanya in 2019. And uh, yeah, actually put in a good uh, appearance. You know, it looked a lot like Adesanya thought he was tricky. I don't think there was too much respect or anything. Well, uh, when you say too much respect, like, I mean, I suspect he res- I suspect he respected Anderson Silva's ability to come back and to surprise him. Um, I don't think it was like, oh, I'm not going to hurt him because he's my hero or whatever. I, I think it was just that he was put off by and- who Anderson Silva is. Um, and then in uh, May of uh, last year, he fought Jared Cannonier and got low kicked to a TKO, which people originally were like, oh, knee injury. Oh, actually here on Tapology, it's still listed as knee injury via leg kick, not not TKO leg kick, which is the truth. Um, yeah, people were just like, oh, no. If you remember, that was like people were like, oh, no, not the leg again. And you go, it's the other leg. <laughs> Fucking hell. How many excuses? First, you're allowing him to do drugs twice based off this low kick injury. Uh, and, and now you're going to excuse getting knocked out with kicks to the other leg. But yeah, that was a, a pretty sad end to uh, Anderson Silva. So it's it's nice that he's got the chance to come back and do this last one against Uriah Hall, who, you know, I think the thing about Uriah Hall is that he's just never been as impressive as he should be. All his wins are like meh decisions or a couple. He's got a couple of knockouts recently, Bevan Lewis and um, Christoph Jocko. But like, and, the, you know, the jumping back kick on Gegard Mousasi, which was only as much of a fluke as Gegard Mousasi's up kick on Jacare. But we'll get into that later. But, you know, he tends to just have unimpressive performances all around. It, the whole time they're talking about how he could jump up and knock this guy out with a wheel kick, but he so seldom does. He got the decision over Shoeface in his last one, which was meh. And then he's had about three bookings that fell through, including Yol Romero, which was just madness. Um... Yeah, he's basically done the... They booked him against the trilogy of old men in that division. Ronaldo Souza, Yoel Romero, and then Anderson Silva. Um, yeah, it's uh, an odd spot he's in. But I, the last one he lost was Paulo Costa, and I thought he looked really not only good, but brave in that fight because he was outgunned and he was doing a good job of just dealing with it. Um, his problems have always been... Actually, his problems have often been on the defensive end. You know, for a guy whose favourite or, or like most famous techniques are like the back kick and the wheel kick, which are typically done as counters. Uh, he really doesn't like being put on the back foot an awful lot, especially because he runs himself onto the fence. Um, you know, if you remember like the uh, time Brunson knocked him out or the time that Weidman knocked him out back in the regionals, which reminds me, we'll be touching in on uh, Gegard Musassi later. But uh, yeah, those were just him getting caught along the fence with his hands down because he always has his hands down because he's got an 80 inch reach or whatever and he thinks he's safe when he isn't. And that was really the clue that Paulo Costa's ring cutting wasn't all that. Uh, Uriah Hall had trouble running onto the fence his entire career, and he was getting away scot free a lot of the time against uh, Paulo Costa. I think with Uriah Hall, you've got a guy who excels because of his physical attributes and isn't particularly slick, uh, is how I put it, because it was scientifically savvy in the striking. You only need to like watch his jabbing performances. There was one on Tough. Um, there was the one against Paulo Costa. There's been a couple, you know, where he just stands there, pumps his jab, and then tries to run away. And it's like there's not much fainting, faking. He can never build off his jab effectively. It's just you have an 80-inch reach, pump the jab whenever you can. I mean, if he had an educated jab, I'd be compelled to see what kind of trouble that could give Anderson Silva because, you know, uh, Michael Bisping, Chris Weidman both had good success by flicking out the jab on the front of their stance and, and not really committing to him, but flicking him with the jab and then following up with good punches afterwards. Um, but uh, no, it's Uriah Hall, so I don't really expect that to be a, a huge part of it. It is weird that this is going to be a, a five-rounder. Um, so I suppose someone has to get finished. because <laughs> Anderson Silva's old and Uriah Hall doesn't tend to... Well, I don't think I've ever seen him go five rounds, has he? Was that Shoeface won five rounds? It was not. But yes, there you go. That's going to be like a weird passing of the torch where we might not even get a passing of the torch. Anderson Silva might win like a depressing decision. If he does something magic, that would be really nice. If he just knocked him out. 
That would be a brilliant way to end the career. To be honest, he doesn't even need to end the career. He's just ending his UFC contract, as far as I know. And he's said he's going to end his career. But honestly, having watched Ong Le Shong's fights this week, he could just go over to one and be one champion, make a ton of money. Ong Le Shong... Actually, we'll get into that when we talk about one's card, because one's card is pretty good. But rest of this UFC card... Your co-mains Bryce Mitchell versus Andre Feely. I thought about doing a little Filthy Casuals guide to this matchup, but I didn't know who would care. Um, Bryce Mitchell's quite interesting because his last two fights he's been using the uh, three-quarter mount slash quarter guard depending on whether you're the top or bottom mount really well which flows into all that uh, far wrist fold down stuff and also into back takes the great thing about the three-quarter mount versus the mount is that it, like in a jiu-jitsu competition it's not great to be in the three-quarter mount you still have a lot of work to, or a little bit of work to do to get to the mount but you're not going to score for getting the three-quarter mount and uh, then you've got to fight their upper body and try and stretch them out and um, free your leg. You know, watch someone like Roger Gracie, brilliant at using the three-quarter mount to go from half guard to full mount. But he has to free his leg first. And a lot of guys are good at getting back to guard or to get getting back to half guard or even going to deep half guard from the quarter mount, or from the uh, from that quarter guard. You know, where they've just got your ankle. Problem is, it's only really a guard in jujitsu. It's not a guard in the sense of a guard in like self-defense or MMA, because where most guards have something controlling the distance, with the exception of closed guard, but then you can pull them in and clinch them, um, the quarter guard or three-quarter or three quarter mount, they're interchangeable, um, has nothing to check the distance. So you can't control the guy. He's just there able to rain down punches on you. And what you've got is your thighs gripped around his ankle. And I think a lot of guys still haven't worked out that it's not a step in the right direction if the other guy is putting you there. If you watch his fight with um, Charles Rosa, Bryce Mitchell, this is, he will put himself into the quarter mount so that he can basically turn um, Rosa on his side. You know, Rosa will grab the ankle or whatever, but you can't bridge and buck and you can't throw your legs up in front of the guy and do all the spazzing that you could normally... Spazzing from, the, from um, being mounted. Surprisingly high success rate compared to spazzing from bottom side control. Um, but you can't do any of that. You can't bridge. You can't do a lot when you're on your side pinching that uh, that ankle. What you can do is turn to your knees and then they take you back, which is what Bryce Mitchell was doing over and over again in that fight. He does some other cool stuff. Like uh, one of his early UFC ones, he was mounted on a guy and he kept trying to do a stockade grip, which is where you like wrap the head and then put your hand inside their armpit on the far side and then ratchet their neck up. And you can start looking for like triangles and things from there. But if you uh, go read my second piece at Fightland on uh, Minoru Suzuki, or maybe it's my first. There's two pieces I wrote at Fightland on Minoru Suzuki, and there's a great example of him in Pancrase getting that stockade with one hand from the mount, dismounting and trying to run around the guy's head to put him in a neck crank. Other thing is that Mitchell isn't bad on the feet. Um, you know, he's, he's awkward and he's, you know, he's got that Dustin Hazlett look about him where he should be only good on the ground, but he's done, he's done surprisingly decently on the feet and he's a southpaw and he does that sort of like spiraling away to his left. So he draws you out and tries to throw the left hand over the top and then runs in on high crotches and stuff. And I think that's quite interesting because Andre Feely, a lot of his best work lately has been the jab and he tends to do well against guys who are going to stand in kickboxing range or guys who want to take him down because he's got really good sprawl and then he'll come up with the jab. Has a lot of trouble with uh, guys who kick him in the leg after his jab. And uh, typically not great at uh, tacking his right hand on the end or, or using the jab to get to more powerful punches. He will uh, establish, the, establish the jab and then that's it. That's the whole performance, basically. You know, He, he doesn't really build off it very well. Sergio Marias, he caught with like a high kick off the jab or a... Uh, oh no, it was a right hand on the counter and then a high kick. But uh, tip, like Andre Fili, who I'm a big fan of, if he could get to it, maybe it's a confidence thing, but he just needs to get to his right hand more. Or even jab in, level change, come up with the left hook, or jab and then low kick. He's just not doing a lot off his jab. And it means that he can have fights with like uh, Miles Jury, where he jabbed him a thousand times in the face. But Miles Jury knocked him down once with a back fist and then caught him with a back fist earlier on. And you're like, well, maybe Andre Feely loses this based on how they score the rounds. But the fun in this is that Andre Feely stops a, a great takedown. You know, he's a team alpha male guys who's working with very, very good wrestlers all the time. And Bryce Mitchell isn't working with a lot of famous people at all. Uh, and that's quite, quite endearing. But also, you know, he's uh, a lot of his game relies on being scrambly. If you watch his fight with, um, what was his name? Something Diamond. Real porn star type name. But uh, the guy who could wrestle. And Bryce Mitchell is like grabbing high crotches and things, which are, you know, great 
we're seeing them more and more. They set up like scrambly exchanges and things, and you're probably not going to get um, sprawled on super hard and front headlocked and stuff. But uh, the guy just grabs a hold of Bryce Mitchell's taint and starts moving to his back. Luckily, Bryce Mitchell's pretty good off the bottom. Uh, does some stuff with the uh, meat hook, which is a rubber guard move. Carlos Condit used to do it a lot too. But I think you've got... Yeah, this could be an interesting fight where Andre Feely keeps him on the feet but can't actually do that much because it's a southpaw opponent and the jab can be taken away by the lead hand. Andre Feely will switch to southpaw. I don't know how good he is with his like normal game out of southpaw. He tends to do it just for little bursts. But if he, he I mean, he could he could stand southpaw in this one and jab Bryce Mitchell's face off, and that wouldn't surprise me. But I think the momentum is very much behind Bryce Mitchell, undefeated as a pro. Um, Andre Feely tends to go like win loss, win loss, but they tend to be good competitive fights, regardless of how good or bad the opponent is, or how good or bad you expect the opponent to be. Ha! Huh. Here's news to me. I was about to say Kevin Holland versus um, Mahmoud Mur- uh, Muradov which I was quite interested in because i just watched Muradov's fights in the UFC, and Muradov has withdrawn since the last time I looked at that, and now um, Kevin Holland is fighting Charlie Ontiveros, whoever he is. So I was going to talk about the interesting ins and outs of that matchup, but now I don't have to. It's Kevin Holland versus some guy that I don't know. you got Greg Hardy versus Maurice Green. Maurice Green, sloppy heavyweight. Greg Hardy, sloppy heavyweight who's embarrassing MMA. And then more interestingly, Maurice Green's much smaller brother, Bobby, is going to be fighting Thiago Moises. Um, that's good. That sounds like a good fight. Bobby Green's been doing good stuff through the um, pandemic. Thiago Moises obviously had that awesome ankle lock submission over uh, Michael Johnson in a fight that Michael Johnson was winning until the last second. Alexander Hernandez versus the Grutz. Chris Grutzmacher. Yeah, cool. Sean Strickland versus Jack Marshall. Oh yeah, Jack Shaw's off this card, but we can give you the Welsh Jack that no one really cares about. Uh, has, I'm trying to remember if Marshman's ever had an entertaining fight. There was that dreadful one with John Phillips, and then he got finished by Shoeface and Edmund Shabazian. Okay, uh, yeah, I would have rather had Jack Shaw, to be honest. Dustin Jacoby's back after a run in glory, um, fighting Justin Ledet. Yeah, oh, Priscilla Cachoeira versus Courtney Casey. Giving Courtney Casey a softball here. If she fucks this one up, I mean, come on. And that's about all we care about from that card. But luckily, there's loads more cards on this weekend. We've got one and we've got Bellator. So I think we'll talk Bellator first because that's got least on it. Bellator 250 from the um, Mohegan Sun Arena in Uncasville, Connecticut, where they all marry their uncles. No, it's on tribal land. And uh, if you missed it, Mike Mazzulli, who's the head of the Mohegan Sun Commission, lol, was getting pissy at fighters, being like, uh, if you can't do it, blah, 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 you must be cutting too much weight. And they was just having an argument with the co-main eventer, Brandon Gertz. Uh, and you're like, calm down, mate. No one is coming to the Mohegan Sun Commission because they're good at their jobs. They're there because you can pay five grand and they'll just let you have whoever fight whoever. Honestly, I looked into running an event on an Indian uh, reservation or tribal. I think it's Indian reservation. I think it's like the National Adva- uh, Association for the Advancement of Coloured Peoples. You use the old word in the official name so i think it is indian reservation but you know correct me if i'm wrong or don't actually um but to run an event on tribal land is very very cheap and also you're not you're not behooven to the somewhat existing standards of the new york state athletic commission or the uh or the nevada state athletic commission texas is the other one you go to if you just want to you know do whatever that's where they did um kimbo versus dada and kimbo versus ken and they talked kimbo down to like a 90 day suspension and then they tried to book him overseas anyway for drugs, that is. Yes, this card is shit. I mean, it's not if you're, like, some bizarre Bellator nutter. And my favourite bizarre Bellator nutter is busy doing a, a complete 180 on all his views because Bellator has cut half their fighters and is now signing, uh, like, young talents and, and shipping off all their established names who or homegrown names. Uh, and this guy's just be like, well, this was always the plan. <laughs> Even though it's clearly Bellator in a death spiral. Jake Hager's on the card, Jack Swagger. He's fighting some bum who's never been beyond the first 50 seconds of a fight. Henry Corrales versus Brandon Gertz. Don't really know enough about them to bother talking about them. And then Gegard Mousasi versus Douglas Lima. Now, this is an interesting one, because on the one hand, Gegard Mousasi is on a two-fight losing streak against geriatrics. But on the other hand, he's undefeated against welterweights who've never fought at middleweight. Which is more powerful, do you think? (laughs) I think this is an interesting fight, because... Musashi, his thing is like he jabs on the feet and then occasionally he'll open up with his right hand, but only if he's fighting someone who's completely useless. You know, he was terrified of Musashi, of Machida rather, in his last one. 
Um, but when he opens up, his like chin comes up in the air, he throws his right hand and he starts swinging. And it looks nothing like as good as his jab. And I think if you're Douglas Lima, you want a low kick on the jab and wait for the right hand. And when you take the right hand on your guard or whatever, come back with the left hook. And th- those two things could ruin Gigard Mousasi's night. Uh, then it basically comes down to the takedowns. Lima, I mean, I'd like to see him in the UFC, but again, I, there's he's a guy who consistently doesn't do enough in my eyes. Like he just he relies on the low kick, and then he doesn't pursue the finish that much. And then he he has a decent left hook, but he can't really build combinations. He barely ever throws his right hand. You know, it's it's just um, he's a frustrating guy to watch, and you wonder how he'd do against like other very very good welterweights in the UFC. But having said all that, I mean, it's the most interesting fight that Bellator's done in a little while, so. Um, Probably worth watching, maybe, I don't know. And then one is actually doing good fights this weekend. You got uh Christian Lee is defending his one welterweight championship against Yuri Lepikus, who I don't really know anything about, but Christian Lee is always good fun. And make sure to watch this one because I guarantee predicting it now, or I don't know if this is in a cage or a a, a ring this time, but I guarantee Olivia Costa will be refing, and I guarantee the Christian Lee will grab the fence at some point and Olivia Costa will do nothing about it. You got uh, Zhang Jingnan versus Tiffany Teo. Uh, Zhang Jingnan, yeah, Zhang Jingnan uh, who I often confuse with Yang, uh, Yang Jianan, notable for being um, the first loss on Angela, Angela Lee's record. Came back, uh, lost a rematch to Angela Lee. I think it was, was that a different weight? Yes, she went flyweight to strawweight. Fuck knows. They, they, it's like Ong, Ong Le Chong. You know, he's got two titles, but you don't remember him having two title fights for them. Um, but yeah, Angela Lee suplexed her on her head and they ignored it because it's Angela Lee. You know, the rules in one will, they distort around the Lee siblings. You got Martin Wynn versus Tan, uh, Than Lee, which will actually be a good fight. Uh, Martin Wynn, really fun, uh, good counter wrestler, good grappler cracking right hand like one of the best right hands you will see on anyone at that weight he takes a run up into it <laughs> uh, and then suddenly really fun kicker uh, both these guys like Martin Wynn Australian thoroughly American but they both have Asian heritage so so one books them like they're local stars it's really weird um, it's like Ang Lashong you know from Myanmar but does all his training with Henry Hooft down at what is it Hard Knocks 365 the only real like, top level team that they have in one in from asia is like uh team lakai which i keep saying i'll do something about but then i don't i mean they must have some tiger muay thai guys there too actually but that brings us on to the main event ang lashong versus renier de, de riddler de riddler rather oh renier de riddler terrific bad guy name better name renier the diddler um bartok the leaper but ang lashong i was watching his fights this week and oh my god he's supposed to be the most famous man in myanmar but then so is dave leduc <laughs> but the way they built him up is like he's an unstoppable force and then i watched his fights and i was like i'm really not blown away his fights with vitali big uh vitali big dash which is a great name in itself vitali big dash slapped the shit out of him in their first fight for five rounds second fight he rocks big dash in the first round with a right hand then is taken down at will for the rest of the fight. And uh, basically, if it weren't one's rules and one's refs, he wouldn't have won because they were in Myanmar. Great. Uh, But they were also, Yuji Shimada's the ref and he is terrified. Well, he's not terrified. He just hates people grappling. Like he breaks them every time that Ang Le Shong is taken down. If Ang Le Shong were fighting in a real uh, promotion against Vitaly Big Dash, the same fight, he'd have lost. Uh, And then you have to rely on the, the one judging, which is, uh, Matt Hume normally just cuts the head off a chicken and lets it run on a Ouija board but one judging is supposed to consider the fight as a whole versus round by round problem is if you go like oh he rocked him in the first five seconds and then he proceeded to lose every subsequent minute of the fight you can give it to the guy who rocked him in the first five seconds and this this is exactly the problem with this sort of scoring go watch those fights because Vitaly Bish- Big Dash was good in them uh, and Ang Lashong was not um but then I watched him fight Ken Hasegawa, and those, those are supposed to be wars, but it's just two dudes getting gassed by the second round and then being unable to finish each other until the fifth. Um, and then he fought Brandon Vera in just like a sloppy slugfest. This dude, I, I promise you, Anderson Silva could be middleweight champion of the world in uh, in one. Oh, this is light heavyweight. Well, I promise you, Anderson Silva could also be the light heavyweight champion. That's, that's what I said. Ong Le has both titles, and you never know what's actually going on. And then he beat the heavyweight champion in a catchweight fight, but they haven't given him the heavyweight title. 
even though heavyweight title is supposed to be absolute. So that'll be worth a watch. Wasn't worth writing an article about, but yeah, it could be some fun. So let's do a couple of questions and then we'll get out of here for this week. Dear Jack, this might be less of a question and more of a depressed rant. Jack, how do you stay passionate about MMA without getting depressed about the UFC's bullshit? You're always saying bollocks on Twitter, or even talking about the UFC's problematic shit on the podcast, and you're surprisingly unemotional. The UFC's bullshit, of course, being lo-fi to play, pay, being lo-fi to pay, which in some cases isn't even enough to cover medical expenses in the USA. 50-50 pay method. I presume that means uh, show money and win money. Shitty gloves which regularly hurt fighters' hands. And with no re- and no research into on possible CTA effects of MMA and on and on. This is just the tip of it. I stopped following NFL and cricket because of their lack of moral compasses. I'm from India, by the way. That's why the cricket. Thanks very much, a recent Patreon boy. P.S. Do you follow cricket at all? If yes, what do you think of England's World Cup win last year? Uh, I don't follow cricket. I used to play it when I was younger, but um, yeah, no, not so much anymore. Never really followed it as a sport. It's a fun game, though. Read the UFC's bullshit. I think... I mean, I got into the UFC because of my interest in combat sports and martial arts, and a large part of that was my love of history of combat sports and martial arts. So if you look at any boxing history, fight promoters have always been the scum of the earth. Like Tex Rickard was a diddler. You know, <laughs> like that's <laughs> He might not have been. Don't sue me Rickard's family, but there was discussion of him being a diddler. There were some like 12 year olds who turned up and had like a very suspiciously accurate memory of one of his apartments on the inside. Um, but yes, promoters have always treated fighters like garbage. And this really gets into sort of like worker relations generally. You know, this is the thing that I can never understand with people. When I, whenever I'm like, yeah, fighters should form a union or whatever. And people are like, unions are bad. And the same people who are like, well, you're free to negotiate your own price. And then you go, cool, can I get some people together and do it? And they go, no, that's cheating. You know, if the UFC or the fight promoter or whatever is allowed to offer you whatever they think you're worth, you should be allowed to group up with other people and demand more. That's how a negotiation works. There should be two sides of it. And these people want one side to be completely like shot in the legs before they're sent in to fight. But um, yes, the pay is an enormous thing. And that's really down to the pay split. But you will never get fighters to think about that. The pay split being, the sorry, the revenue split being uh, that every other major league that has a players association has negotiated for a 50-50 split between the uh, the league and the players. And it works for the NBA, for the NFL, the MLB. You know, everyone who says this wouldn't work in MMA, it would bankrupt the UFC, is a fucking idiot or just disingenuous. And then you've got the other disingenuous idiots who are like, well, it would result in the top fighters being paid less. You're like, how? You really think they wouldn't be able to pay Habib? Well, they claimed six million. That's still quite low for your biggest star. Uh, in, in fact, that's incredibly low for your biggest star. You think that if they divided the revenue between the fighters and the promotion 50-50, that they couldn't afford to pay Habib more than $6 million. Have a think about that and then come back. But um, yeah, the pay thing is going to take someone, well, it's going to take the fighters, realising that they have been getting gypped the entire time. And they, at the fighters' retreat, which they haven't done since because the fighters got together, and uh, Leslie Smith asked uh, Kobe Bryant on stage, you know, how important was the NBA Players Association to you? And Kobe Bryant, who was you know, one of the top three, four paid players in the N- in the NBA at the time. Was he higher paid than LeBron? I can't remember if he was or not. But, you know, one of the highest paid stars in NBA was like, oh yeah, no, the uh, Players Association is invaluable and uh, I wouldn't be able to earn my money. We wouldn't be safe. You know, my teammates wouldn't earn money. And that's the other thing. Like, even though it's an individual sport, everyone in MMA has teammates. And you're just wondering, like, are you happy... If you're Conor McGregor and Paddy Houlihan's being paid shit, do you want to keep giving your friend hands out, handouts to make them feel better? No, you want them to earn the fucking money that they deserve. But the other things he said were like 50-50 pay. Show, show money, win money is a difficult one because you do want to in- incentivize winning. It's like you want to incentivize being in- exciting in this sport. You, you want to give people bonuses, but you, you have to call the performance bonuses now, even though they only count for knockouts and um, submissions, because you're not allowed to call it the knockout of the night because it makes people think about the CTE, which, the, which was the other part of the question. Studies on effects of CTE, we already know the effects of CTE. Like, there's no point doing a study on it because you're just paying to make yourself look bad. Um, if you're in the sport, you have accepted or are in denial over the idea of CTE. But you should be paid enough that you can ha- make a career out of this in the time before you get CTE. It's like Brett Johns was on the other day um, on, I think he was on The Bash, which is a good podcast. 
But he was just saying, like, I went to, I left the UFC and went to Bellator because I was asking for more money, and I wasn't asking for crazy money. I was just asking for enough money to pay off my house, you know. And he was like, you know, I, I sh- I'm not asking for Conor McGregor's money. I'm not. I just want to be paid like this is my job, like it's a career. Because you're giving up an awful lot to do this. That's the really stupid thing. The whole Dana White being like, oh, this is an opportunity or whatever. You're giving up a large portion of your life to even be able to train enough to take part in the UFC. And I, the really weird thing is that just being such a skinflint over it anyway, if you want the sport to be better, you want people to want to be in the sport, so you want to pay more. It's such a short-sighted way of looking at it. But again, you need a players association before they'll even consider it. Anyway, how do I stay so positive about it? Because I've always been aware that all promoters are scum. Um, And this is a sport where we have to be able to laugh at... You know, it's like doctors being able to have a a morbid sense of humour. I know that everyone I'm watching now is going to end up probably penniless and brain damaged by the time that they're 60. But I do enjoy the fights and, you know, we've got to have a laugh about that. Is it depressing? Yes. The secret is to not think about it. Cheers, dude. Good afternoon, Jack. Do you think it was a loss that we didn't get to see Jose Aldo versus this Brian Ortega? How do you think that would have went down? Also, do you see GSP versus Habib at all? I don't think it's realistically possible. GSP was always a filled out welterweight and looked slower at middleweight anyway. I think it's AKA trying to grab headlines and uh, headspace. Kind regards from Tommy. Um, Yeah, I don't think GSP versus Habib happens. Um... You know, GSP gave himself crones or something like that, didn't he, by trying to pack on weight. Uh, You know, I don't think he's going to be fucking around with his diet too much now. And also, like, GSP seems like a guy who's happy uh, and loves martial arts, but I don't know if he's that driven to to bother coming back, Um, especially if you see interviews with him nowadays. Um, Ri Habib, yeah, I, I expect he'd probably like the fight, but if he's been paid as much as they say he's been paid, he can probably live quite comfortably out in uh, the Caucasus for however long. And he's a beloved celebrity. You know, he'll be like Ka- uh, Carolyn, just move straight into a political career. Yeah, I, really, it comes down to how sincere either of them are with their retirement. And to be honest, I don't think even they know that because everyone, that people wouldn't retire if they didn't feel like they were done. And then they all come back because they go, oh, no, I've still got the bug. I've got the bite. Oh, I'm itching. Um jonesing for the combat sports high so honestly i wouldn't write it off because like who'd have, who'd have thought bisping versus gsp for the middleweight title would happen you know it's weird things happen in this sport jose aldo versus this brian ortega though um yeah i didn't even talk about brian ortega because we i missed that um oh yeah i was doing killing the king habib which you should read um so i didn't talk about brian ortega versus korean zombie but he looked really good he looked really good um he looked a lot more comfortable boxing it looked like before he looked like he was pretending he was comfortable boxing or he thought he was comfortable boxing but was actually really sloppy. And this one, he actually looked good. <laughs> you know, he looked very slick uh, and was giving uh, the Korean zombie a lot of trouble. How would he do against Jose Aldo? I don't think he was Jose Aldo good. And uh, the other thing is that Brian Ortega's takedowns have historically sucked. I think people... I don't like doing this like, you know, I think people underestimate how good someone was. But I think people genuinely do underestimate how good Jose Aldo was. Um... Yeah, no, Aldo would probably eat him alive. Cheers, Tommy. Hello there, Jack. Me and my mate were recently discussing MMA. This guy's a a cockney in my head. uh, And came into the subject of physical advantages. He mentioned that an overbite would be an advantage because your chin is smaller. (laughs) Slash easier to cover up. However, I said it would be a disadvantage of anything. We were both... We then both struggled to name fighters who have overbites for 20 minutes. Do you think an overbite is an advantage, disadvantage, or makes zero difference? And can you name a fighter or any fighters who have overbites? Many thanks from Alex. Uh, This is like, I mean, there is Homer Simpson who fought Dredrick Tatum for um, the World Heavyweight title. He could take an incredible punch if he had an overbite. Now, I'm trying to think of overbites too. (laughs) So fucking weird. It's like when people are like, can you name any top athletes with uh, diabetes? And you go, Buster Douglas. And then that's about it. Um, no, that's me thinking in real time. I can't think of any. Right. Answers on the bottom. In the YouTube comments, I want to hear fighters with overbites. And we will assess how good their chins were or weren't. Cheers, Alex. Right. I reckon that'll do us for today. I'm going to be back on Monday to talk about whatever's happened over the weekend. There's plenty going on. 
And I'll probably be writing something over the weekend too. So if you want to support the podcast, get in on the extra stuff we do with the Patreon boys, sign up to the Patreon. If you want to send an email to the podcast, fight's gone by podcast at gmail.com. And if you want to see what I'm writing at any time, fightprimer.com. I'm your boy Jack Slack, pretending that Musasi could beat Israel Adesanya. Bless. <laughs>